Good morning. I'm calling this meeting of the Yuma County Board of Supervisors to order. Uh, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll ask oh. Mr. Bill Kirkus to lead us in the pledge. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. To every everyone, we have the first discussion and action item, which is discussion and action to select a chairperson for the purpose of conducting the April 3rd, 2023 meeting only in anticipation of the absence of the chairman and vice chairman. I would entertain a motion to select a chair for this meeting. I'll make a motion that we appoint, appoint Tony as the uh, acting chairman for this meeting since oh. he's been doing it long enough. He ought to know how to run it. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yeah, before I warn you, this will take longer now. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the meeting is yours. Thank you. Um, this reminds me of something, but I'm not going to get into that. All right, we, the first item is call to the public. Call to the public is held for the public benefit to allow individuals to address issues within the board's jurisdiction. Board members may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to Arizona revised statutes, action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to criticism, or scheduling the matter for further discussion and a decision at a future date. Public comments may be made in person or submitted by email at publiccomment at yumacountyaz.gov. The email forms for public comments will be accepted until 8 a.m. the morning of the meeting. All public comments will be read out loud during the Yuma County Board of Supervisors that starts at 9 a.m. Christy, do we have any... You know? We do not. Does anyone here in the public wants to address the board that in an item that is not in the in the agenda? If not, we'll move on to presentations, proclamations, and appointments. And during this segment of the agenda, board members may discuss the presentations and proclamations and may announce appointments to the Yuma County Planning and Zoning Commission and the Yuma County Board of Adjustment. There will be no legal action taken. Uh, and I'll begin by uh, the first proclamation, which uh, proclaims uh, April 2023 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Yuma County, and this will be done by Supervisor Simmons. Okay, proclaiming the month of April 2023, Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month. Whereas in federal fiscal year 2021, 3.9 million reports were made to Child Protective Services, and whereas child abuse and neglect is a serious problem affecting every segment of our community, and finding solutions requires input and action from everyone. And whereas our children are our most valuable resource and will shape the future of Yuma County. And whereas child abuse can have long-term psychological, emotional, and physical effects that have lasting consequences for victims of abuse. And whereas protective factors are conditions that reduce or eliminate risk and promote the social, emotional, and developmental well-being of children. And whereas effective child abuse prevention activities succeed because of the partnerships created between child welfare professionals, education, health, community, and faith-based organizations, businesses, law enforcement agencies, and families. And whereas communities must make every effort to promote programs and activities that create strong and thriving children and families. And whereas we acknowledge that we must work together as a community to increase awareness about child abuse and contribute to promote the social and emotional well-being of children and families in a safe, stable, and nurturing environment. And whereas prevention remains the best defense for our children and families. Now, therefore, the Yuma County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaim the month of April 2023 to be Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month. Right, they will, there There are some people, some special people that are here to receive the proclamation. Do you mind telling us who they are? Uh, yes, we have our um, Tori Borgnon, who is the executive director of Amberley's Place, and she'll be here. Okay, do you want to say a few words? Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Supervisors, County Administrators. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak briefly this morning. Um, I know that, that Supervisor Simmons read our national statistics for child abuse, but I want to share a little bit with you briefly about what 2022 looked like right here in Yuma County. So Yuma County alone, through Amber Lee's place, 
and with all of our partner agencies, 268 primary victims of sexual abuse and 485 secondary victims. And it's an important distinction because what happens when abuse happens in a family, the family tends to augment. So when we work with a child abuse victim, we work with the entire family, therefore primary and secondary victims. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. There were 77 physical abuse cases and 110 secondary victims from those cases. So those are the 22 stats. Child abuse is unfortunately an issue right here in Yuma County. And so we thank you. We thank you for your support. We thank you for allowing us to continue to do this work in our community. Um, and we thank our partner agencies. I see Jody and Evita from the Safe House and Catholic Community Services here. Um, victim services today, no? John Smith from the county attorney, and I don't see the victim advocates, but if you're our partner agency and I didn't see you walk in the door, thank you. Thank you so much for your efforts on behalf of children and family in our community. I have my advocates here, Sonia Salcido, Jojo Rojas, Melissa, and Dina, where'd you, and Dina Evancho um, in the back, and daily, 365 days a year, 24 seven. These are the folks, not just our staff, but everybody, that continually do this work on behalf of children and families in our community. So thank you for recognizing Child Abuse Awareness Month and thank you again for your support. I'll take a picture thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Come on, guys. Everybody else. Come on. You're in the middle over here. I'm in the middle? Okay, I'll get on this side. Don't well, I don't know what happened. Uh, I know you didn't come through. Okay. Oh, no. Put your shoes on there. Yeah. Oh, we all should have one. Hold on. Are you going to bow it? Yeah. But we are going to hold them. Yeah. Don't just hold them. Give Mary one. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> so two days later, they found it. Thank you. You guys do a great job. Thank you. 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 Thank Oh, we have the check. The salvation. The salvation. No, no. Mission. Yeah. Okay, next we have the full appreciation. It's not going to be my fault. It will take longer than normal. <laughs> sure. Okay, well, we'll move on to the... Uh, Proclamation that proclaims April 2023 as Yuma County Government Employee Appreciation Month, <coughs> and that will also be done by Supervisor Simmons. Okay, proclaiming the month of April 2023 as Yuma County Government Employee Appreciation Month. Whereas Yuma County and its employees play an essential role in keeping our community safe and secure by preserving public health and well being, ensuring public safety, and promoting local economies while providing professional and dedicated public services. And whereas Yuma County and its employees take their role seriously in protecting, protecting and enhancing the health, welfare, and safety of citizens in our community and to delivering effective quality services while containing costs through efficient use of local tax dollars. And whereas Yuma County is one of 15 counties in the state of Arizona responsible for serving the needs of every resident, Yuma County reflects the wide diversity of people, cultures, and landscapes in our state with Yuma County's employees having a reputation for quality and excellence. And whereas the Board of Supervisors appreciates and acknowledges our employees who demonstrate integrity, commitment, and dedicated service each and every day on behalf of our community. Now, therefore, the Yuma County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaim the month of April 2023 to be Yuma County Government Employee Appreciation Month. And before we move on to presenting the proclamation, I'd like to state the obvious. We don't sell gum or we don't sell inventory. What we do is provide a lot of services to the community. And the fact that that we can actually tell you how much we appreciate that, it's an honor for us. I mean, as supervisors, we know we depend on your service and the 
quality of the service you give to the residents of Yuma County. So we appreciate what you do and we think we'll show you later on when we discuss your salary. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we'll give, go ahead and give you this proclamation. Jessica Please. Rodriguez, are you come on? Yeah. And uh, you will be, re oh, you're gonna say something. If you don't mind, oh, yeah. if that's okay. <laughs> Good morning, supervisors. Good morning. Good morning. I don't have any pinwheels, but oh, Jessica God. Rodriguez, Interim Human Resources Director. I am so grateful to be able to stand up here and accept this proclamation on behalf of all of the counties and courts employees. Before I go into some highlights that we've prepared this year, I'd like to recognize a really special group of people who most are standing behind me right now. They are a group who provide all of our employee benefit and wellness resources, wellness resources throughout the year, our employee relations solutions, recruitment requests and needs, safety and security support, risk and liability support and solutions, training and professional development, and administrative support through our front office. And they're also responsible for organizing all of the events that I'm gonna to talk to you about here shortly. And I just don't want that to go unrecognized for them. I'd also like to extend an appreciation for our HR families within the Sheriff's Office, as well as the court families who provide assistance every day, okay? So with that being said, and they're all standing behind me now. For the month of July, for starting this fiscal year, we were able to um, arrange family bowling at Inca Lanes for all of our court and county employees. In September, we inspired creativity by hosting six days of pottery painting with Artsy Fartsy. In October, we did a fall movie night and had Hocus Pocus show for all of our family members. In December, we did photos with Santa at the main library. And in March, we did a Get Air Jump event, which promoted wellness and employee appreciation. The entire month of April, we will be lighting up our county buildings in dark pink, which symbolizes gratitude and appreciation promoting happy and positive energy in our work environment. The County Administration Building, Adult Probation, the Historic Courthouse, the Justice Center, and the Main Library will be illuminated throughout the month of April. April 14th, we will be showing our nightly movie um, at the Main Library. We'll be doing Moana. This event is free, and we will be having Wild West popcorn and Snow on the Go ice cream and face painting available for all of our court and county employees. And then on April 19th, we will be celebrating our Employee of the Year Safety Excellence Award and also our years of service. So we invite everybody to join us at the Historic Art Center for that. So with that being said, I just wanna show everybody that we're so appreciative of everything that we do and come together to work as a team to provide the excellent customer service and resources that we do for the county and courts. So thank you for allowing me this opportunity today. All right. Come on, everybody. I don't want to just come on. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've been working. <laughs> <laughs> there are, yeah, there are, there are so much. <laughs> Yes. Okay, we got a scrunch. So, oh, there oh, needs to be another one on that side. Oh, one. Yeah, we'll get a couple get more over here. Two on we'll that side. Get a couple over here. I told you this direction. We need to balance each other out. Yes. Fortunately, we have to have the vice chair in this one. Thank you. Thank you guys for all you guys. We appreciate it. Thank you, Larry. Yes. Thank you. You're fortunate we don't have anything else to hand out. Otherwise, Larry would have put it in. Thank you, Larry. Did you have to go in first? All right, the third uh, proclamation is uh, proclaiming the week of April 3rd through the 9th as Public Health Week in Yuma County, and that would also be read by Supervisor Sim. <clears throat> proclaiming the week of April 3rd through the 9th, 2023, as Public Health Week in Yuma County. 
whereas the week of April 3rd through the 9th, 2023, is National Public Health Week, and the theme is Centering and Celebrating Cultures in Health. And whereas public health professionals help communities prevent, prepare for, and withstand and recover from the impact of a full range of health threats, including disease outbreaks such as COVID-19, pandemic, natural disasters, and disasters caused by human activity. And whereas public health action together with scientific and technological advances has played a major role in reducing, and in some cases, eliminating the spread of infectious disease and in establishing today's disease surveillance and control systems. And whereas now more than ever, it is important to understand the value of public health and to con continue building strong public health systems for sustaining and improving community health. Now, therefore, the Yuma County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaim the week of April 3rd through the 9th, 2023, to be Public Health Week in Yuma County and call upon the people of Yuma County to observe this week by helping our families, friends, neighbors, coworkers, and leaders to better understand the value of public health and supporting the great opportunities to adopt preventative lifestyle habits in light of this year's theme, Centering and Celebrating Cultures and Health. And Diana. Good morning, um, <clears throat> members of the, more, of the board. Uh, Diana Gomez, I just want to thank you for your ongoing support. Um, public health, um, I didn't bring all my staff, um, but um, I have some um, members of my nursing staff back there. Um, public health is, is, is wide and what, you know, the, the scope of our work is varied. We do everything from animal control to environmental health, inspections to prenatal visits. We assist with, again, the surveillance of disease, the response to disease, and as you saw with COVID-19, the recovery. We're, um, sometimes we're the lead and sometimes we're the, um, in the background supporting our clinical partners like we did during COVID, making sure they had the equipment and the staffing that they need. So again, none of this would be possible without a diverse network of community partners um, who help us keep this community safe and resilient. And again, um, without your support. So thank you very much on behalf of myself and my entire staff. Well, before we go out and um, and give you the proclamation, I, I'd like to you know acknowledge the fact that you know, during the crisis that we've had, and I'm not going to get into all the crisis that we've had, the willingness of the health department to go out in the community and, and provide that service, whether it was at the border or whether it was someplace else, was always special to me. I think that and a department that reacts by reaching out to the people it's a good department no matter what they do but in this case there you know the fact that it was a health crisis made it even more important so thank you very much and thank your staff for being so willing to go out there and actually meet the people where they needed the help thank you very much this just give them the proclamation and hope they don't ask for a raise or anything like that this guy's in last today so who's coming So we go to the fourth proclamation. They're proclaiming the week of April 23, 23rd to 29th as the National Library Week, and that will be read by Supervisor Pankhurst. Proclaiming the week of April 23rd through the 29th, 2023 as National Library Week. Whereas libraries provide the opportunity for everyone to pursue their passions and engage in lifelong learning, allowing them to live their best life. And whereas libraries strive to develop and maintain programs and collections that are as diverse as the populations they serve and ensure equity of access for all. And whereas libraries adapt to the ever-changing needs of their communities, continually expanding their collections services and partnerships 
And whereas libraries play a critical role in the economic vitality of communities by providing internet and technology access, literacy skills, and support for job seekers, small businesses, and entrepreneurs, and whereas libraries are cornerstones of democracy, promoting the free exchange of information and ideas for all. I therefore, now therefore I, Martin Porches, Chairman of the Yuma County Board of Supervisors, proclaim the week of April 23rd through the 29th, 2023 to be National Library Week. During the wait, oh, I want to finish. During this week, <laughs> during this week, I encourage all residents to visit their library to explore the wealth and resources available. There we go. Now, before you start, okay, I, I just want to say something. Whenever we conduct a survey, which we don't conduct very often, about you know how the public views the county, the library always ends up in the top. And it, there's a reason for that. And I think the reason is people like you guys that do the job and make sure that people understand that libraries are more than just a place to store books. And I think that's very, very, very evident in all the stuff you do, including Mrs. Wisdom being like the face of the county, and, you know, you count. Uh, but I mean, we, we're really proud of the library. I, we don't understand why the sheriff department comes in fast or sit here. <laughs> but the library always comes up on top, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that you guys just don't just provide services, but you provide immense help to a lot of people. So thank you very much for what you do, and we'll give you information oh, oh. for a couple yeah. of words. Supervisor <laughs> Lisa Mendez, library director, um, thank you so much for supporting um, the libraries. You know, our job is to find out what our community needs. We continue to do that. We've partnered with the health department, giving free COVID tests out to patrons. Um, you know, we look for grants to help provide even more. Our library foundation and friends of the library helped to support us. The library foundation helped us make a media studio room that is amazing. You know, so we continue to look for things to help our community. And um, and thanks to Sarah for putting together all of our media to, to get people into the library. And yeah, we should have gotten one of those big library cards. Got one. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what I said. Uh -huh. Here we go. I'm coming, I'm coming, guys. Well, I hope, I have all my meetings at the library, so I'm going to meet with people. I always meet at the library. Come, come she looks a lot taller on TV. <laughs> That's the size of my library card. So <laughs> hey, you made a pretty picture. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for the gesture. Thank you. 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 One more. One more and I'll get us I'll go by yes. All right. Uh, we'll move on to the next proclamation, which is also proclaiming in the, the month of April 2023 as Fair Housing Month in Yuma County. Uh, and that would also be read by Supervisor Franco. Proclaiming the month of April 2023 Fair Housing Month. Whereas April 23rd marks the 55th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, which emphasizes the national policy of fair housing. And whereas this act under Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 affirms the right of all citizens to equal housing opportunities free from discrimination based on race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, or familial status, and whereas implementation of the fair housing policy of Yuma County requires positive commitment, involvement, and support from each and every one of our citizens, and whereas the Board of Supervisors wishes to create equal housing opportunities for all persons living, working, traveling through, or doing business in Yuma County, and whereas Fair Housing Month is a time to set aside 
each year to remind citizens that we are not on, that we not only have the right to own and rent property, but we also have an individual responsibility to guard that those rights um, to guard those rights from infringement. I therefore now now therefore I Martin Porches, chairman of the Yuma County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaim the month of April 2023 to be Fair Housing Month. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that was a well written proclamation. It didn't have anything after. <laughs> so now, you know, as a, as a person that you know, has worked in affordable housing for years, I can tell you right now that the, the fact that you're paying special attention to the Fair Housing Act, it's always a good mm -hmm. idea. I think people forget just how bad it can be. Uh, thank you for reminding everybody that, and uh, invite me. Uh, I'd like to say just a few words in there. I'm over time. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm here with Veronica Garcia. We're, um, we just want to let you know thank you for supporting our Diana Velos with uh, County Administration. Thank you very much for supporting our um, owner occupied housing rehabilitation program. And we just finished wrapping up our emergency. And Veronica is going to announce some events that are coming. Yeah, so as um, housing program providers, it is our responsibility um, to know about or learn about the act and understand the fair housing rights of our you know, clients and also to educate our clients about their, their rights of fair housing. So there is going to be an event um, that is going to be held online actually tomorrow. So we wanted to take the opportunity to invite um, you all in the community to register for the event. Um, it is being held by the uh, Southwest Fair Housing Council. Um, it is entitled The Fair Housing and Me, Understanding Your Fair Housing Rights. It'll be taking place uh, tomorrow, April 4th. Um, there's actually gonna be two sessions, um, one at 9 a.m. It'll run for two hours, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And um, this one's gonna be in English. And then there's gonna be a second session um, in Spanish. Uh, from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., also tomorrow. And um, people can register online through the Southwest Fair Housing Council website, or they can go into um, register through Eventbrite. And the website is um, yumafhme.eventbrite.com. So any questions, they can always contact us. And can realtors get credit for part of their 24-hour renewal? Um, I am not sure if they do or not. Um, I just they can ask. find out on their own. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know me. <laughs> can take it anyway. Oh, uh, yeah. Really? That'd be good for them. Yes. Let me go in. I'm to get my thing. So I'll come back outside now. I was trying to get those out, man. <laughs> 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 but I'm not going to do that. Oh, I know. It oh, is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Well, did you know that women couldn't get buy houses on their own until 1968? Yeah, until this was passed. Women couldn't buy their own houses. I can't believe that. So, oh, here, you need to put it with him. He'll take care of this one. <laughs> You notice she only gets Thank two you. out there. Thank you guys. Thank you. 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 All right, so the next item is a, pr a presentation, uh, an update on Yuma County broadband programs and initiatives. Uh, you know, my favorite, hey. uh, a broadband, uh, I mean, a, excuse me, a PowerPoint presentation. So. Oh, thank you. Uh, you don't know me well enough. I <laughs> That's okay. I, I want to hear what the update is. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chairman Board. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you very much, County Manager. Appreciate you. Um, I'd like to talk today, just briefly, give you an update on the Middle Mile Yuma, Yuma County Fiber Project, where we are, the status of progress, and where we're going in the future. Try and make this straight to the point and have opportunity for questions if you have any at the end. Please. Potter in the middle transition. Thank you. 
So real quick, just wanted to highlight, this is actually um, what the middle mile fiber project plan looks like. As you can see, we have, a, a, we are calling it, referencing it as a snowman because it has three separate sections of redundant rings. Um, you can see that it's highlighted with dark fiber, under construction, and planned dark fiber. So dark fiber means that the fiber is actually in place, it's just not lit. Under construction is they're putting in the conduit or possibly putting the dark fiber through at some point. And planned dark fiber is where they're going next to soon put in conduit. So if we take a look at the top section, in the lower right, you see all three of that snowman and a circle highlighting one specific section. This is a section where they're beginning project. They're beginning the process of the project. In the upper left-hand corner of that tiny of that uh, map, you'll see something in yellow. The yellow area is actually fiber that's been put in. So when I arrived here about eight weeks ago, this was incomplete. We had a lot of zeros. We had a lot of information where there was not progress being able to be delivered. So working with the provider and what it takes to get the phases identified, labeled, and then set the priorities for each of those, they've actually completed as of last Friday that first section, phase 1A. So we have fiber in the ground as well as the conduit that is complete and ready for lighting. Next phase they're going to is 2A, which we'll cover in a minute. Um, update, as far as on track, are we on track? That became one of the first key questions. There's a lot of money and investment and time that's been put into this project, and I want to say also thank you very much for the leadership, for the board, for everything you've done. You know, my decision to come here and be part of this county was based on what I'd seen. I, I did a review of what the project possibly looks like, where it's going, what the concepts were, and the support that I've seen has been nothing but monumental. In a, in a state which has a, a beautiful landscape, we have 15 counties. This is the one that I felt was leading the way in, in the projects and the efforts that are being done. So are we on track? Yes. Measurements are being on track in a measurement compared with ARPA fundings and ARPA funding timelines. Mm -hmm. So there's specific guidelines on how that money can be spent and when it needs to be spent. We are on track for that spending. Doubling capacity. One of the things that I've worked with Allo on is to have a conversation. They're working across the, basically the western side of the entire state. So where they're doing construction, they may have issues where they're slowing down progress. They're not able to get shovels in the ground or do the work in other areas, in other counties. I've asked them when that happens, what does it take to get those shovels put down here? And working in collaboration with other leaders inside of our county to help get permitting processes, get things ahead of schedule, we can actually start doubling our capacity and getting additional workforce down here to build, build this infrastructure faster. Um, ex we're expecting significant progress in the three ring design by the end of 2023. The target project was about 2024 December and after evaluating what's possible, if we can get the timelines crunched down, we think we can pull it by almost a full year. So we want to see as significant progress as possible by the end of this year. Uh, expansion eastward along the I-8 will continue into 2024. We will not be able to probably get that included in the 2023 milestones, but it is still on track to be delivered by 2024. Uh, we will have the completed project by the end of December in ARPA funding requirements. <sighs> challenges to this point. So some of the challenges to this point have been uh, permitting. Permitting, we have a significant number of water crossings. 119 that go through the Water Users Association uh, 24 within the county, and I, I want to say uh, from the county has done every effort and done remarkable in delivering what's required from this permitting process. Um, and uh, the Water Users Association, working with them, I'm going to talk about that here in the resolutions, with 119 permits. We have five of those that were required in order to complete 1A. We got those completed. Additional permits from BOR and the city of Yuma. And we have a challenge of delayed funding. The ACA has not yet delivered on a $10 million fund that's due uh, for part of that last mile. So, uh, we're, resolutions, how do we address that? Uh, working with the Uno, Yuma County Water Users Association, we wanted to streamline the approval process. Working very closely with that leadership, we're, we're in weekly communications with uh, the Users Association as well as with Allo. We do this uh, every week. It's on Tuesdays bi-weekly and weekly on every Wednesday. Uh, we have a checklist development coming from the Water Users Association. This is going to help streamline the process of getting approvals. Ideally, they'll be able to identify what's going to be required for a permit request. So when that, that request comes in, 
somebody that's submitting the request can actually review the specific checklist items in that, verify that they're compliant. When they submit it, it's going to be a better opportunity for a first pass through. This will lower the, that barrier of delay. Typically, the process has been uh, very specifically followed. And, and due to the nature of the timing that we have on this project and the money that has to be spent, we've asked us how can we expedite this permit process. Irrigation districts, the BOR, and save humor permits and submissions and collaboration, as I just mentioned, and establishing a cadence with the broadband office. This is to help identify delayed funding. And the cadence is set that on a weekly basis, it's a touch base with the ACA. I, I reach out to Sandeep every week, and he gets back to me when he has the opportunity, but there is some kind of communication that's going on, which has been improving. As a matter of fact, I spoke with Sandeep yesterday on Sunday, wanted to give me some updates on other projects and efforts that I've been making some requests on. So we are in collaboration and constant communication. Um, I've made a trip actually up to Phoenix to have face-to-face -face with them to talk about the release of that funding, when is it coming? And we're not the only ones asking, obviously, but he has committed that he's going to be providing regular update on that status. So hopefully I'll have better information. Next time we'll be able to say we have the 10 million and we're ready to move forward with that. Uh, other developments. What's ongoing? So as I mentioned, we have a middle mile project review. This is a bi-weekly with county and ALO partner meeting. We address communications, engineering, permitting, plans, changes. As you might imagine, they want, the planning process is set for phases 1A, 1B, 1C, 2A, 2B. Some of those priorities have to shift. Part of those shift because of one permitting that becomes available. Some may have lower barriers of entry to be able to get completed. And other times, they may be able to offer a second group that's coming down to help do work. They don't want them over top of current infrastructure, so they're going to go to another area and start building out. When that happens, there's going to be a shift in the priorities of the timelines of what's going to get accomplished. Ideally, everything is moving up and not back. Uh, Yuma County Fiber Progress Touch Points. Every week, meet with broadband uh, with myself and the Allo Construction team and their lead to address any statuses, roadblocks, and action items. These are the three things we talk about. We set a 30-minute meeting simply to make sure that we're on track. If there's something that's a, a new object that they have to overcome, the question is, how do I help? What can we do? Do we have to get somebody else from the county involved? Do we have to get somebody from the Water Users Association? Or is it an external partner we have to reach out to and build that communication? It's been very productive. It's helping us stay on track each week, knowing what their challenges are or what they're facing. Transparency. Transparency becomes a transparency to the, to the entire community, not just to our group that's working on this, but how do we give this information back out to our community so that they're aware of what's happening? We're, collaboration, we're doing collaboration on a project to put out a dashboard. There actually is a link there that is active. Now, that is going to update and change. I'm looking to see how we can have that as not being in allocommunications.com, but focusing on the county. They are building that infrastructure, they're building that design on the website simply because they know where they're going, when it's complete, and they're able to provide that update. We don't, we're not managing that. That's part of the agreement that was actually put in place. Yuma County has its own dashboards, which they're utilizing for our own purposes, but that's not a, it's not the same thing as last mile configuration ready. This provides information on last mile, so people might know that construction is happening. It's that first, basically the first image I'd shown you. When construction is happening, what's going in, and when it's complete. Um, awareness and defining. Some of the things that we want to ask of that, that I've had the conversations with, with Allo, a list of services, cost of services, and timeline of services. This is the middle mile. This is not final mile. Final mile is going to be, once the middle mile is in place, ISPs can then start putting in a request for service. that They want to gain access. They want to deliver services to the last mile to homes. We have to be able to identify for them where, how, where, how much, what's the timeline for this, so that they can begin their construction process and their planning. That is, that's also part of the process of giving that as a, a dashboard up front so that they can act on it. So what's next? Well, we are working very hard to get that middle mile infrastructure in place. There's another opportunity that we have to look at on our agricultural infrastructure. Inside of Yuma County, there's about 180,000 acres. It's about 470 farms. Yuma County, if, if people don't, are not aware, Yuma County really leads the nation in some of the best water conservation already. Precision agriculture is a great opportunity. One of the things that we can do to help the, our community, to help the farming community, and to promote a, a better lifestyle for, for everybody, because if, believe it or not, 
Uh, Yuma County provides about 90% of the nation's greens for a significant period of time over the year. So to help with food scarcity challenges, if we build an agricultural infrastructure with an area that's going to cover most of this distance, um, we're going to look at water conservation management, ag tech, and some of this ag tech is everything from drones, smart precisions, um, precision agriculture, smart farms with remote vehicles that, that are the remote tractors, autonomous. It, it's really rather amazing. It gets me kind of excited to talk about because when you see what that impact does, how does that help workforce development, that all rolls downhill. And building out an infrastructure that provides a service to our farming communities really helps build the community as a whole inside of Yuma County. <laughs> and the map is for reference because it's representative of potential infrastructure. We're looking at right now currently evaluating a number of different opportunities or different methods. Everything from ag top from towers with uh, uh, radio tower signals to uh, CBRS, LoRaWAN. These are all different technologies that provide different types of services. And so it may be a hybrid model. So how do we look at getting that taken care of? How, how, what does that infrastructure look like? This will tag on to our existing middle mile once that's complete. So we can build this actually in collaboration with because we have planning of where that middle mile fiber will be transitioning. We have a funding request for an SLFRF proposal for $6 million in with the governor's office. As I spoke with the governor's office on Friday. Everything is moving forward. I've, they, initially, it was approved in December. Um, it was recalled with the new governor, reevaluated. I've had several meetings with the governor's office about how do we continue this forward. I've, Resubmitted all the paperwork that's required, and with the help of, uh, unfortunately, our team has left. Most of the team that was here, they were fantastic in helping getting the documentation organized, structured. We reevaluated together as a team and submitted that back. Um, and I got a call, as I said, from the governor's office on Friday confirming that everything was received and moving forward positively. The community funding project requests another request that's coming out for Congressman Gallo, Gallo uh, Senator Kelly, and Senator Cinema. Both of them, well, all three of them, have opportunities to fund a project for $3 million to $6 million. That has been submitted as well. I put in a request to try and get additional funding from all three of those offices, and specifically outlining how this helps with water and ag tech. Uh, Senator Cinema is very excited about the opportunity and, and kind of leading the conversation right now. Um, technology that's going to be involved will be evaluating, as I mentioned, various opportunities for long, long view use. Tower structures, monopoles, omnidirectional antennas, CBRS, LoRaWAN, other options. Meeting with, we met with three different providers for three different types of services just to get a better understanding of what's possible and, and understanding our landscape. Fortunately, Yuma, for the most part, is pretty flat. We don't have a whole lot of structure when it comes to worrying about enormous trees or uh, mountains or, or hard rock. So that provides us a lot more opportunity than if we were in a different part of the region. So uh, communication, part of the other forward growing effort is communication for defining a process for visibility, specifically to help with the city of Somerton and the city of San Luis. These are not lost on visibility. We want to make sure that people understand that we are moving in that direction. We're going to work to build the timelines. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first permits have already been submitted as a request for city of San Luis. So there is progress being made. In consideration, uh, I'm considering hosting a quarterly communications with stakeholders meetings update perhaps an opportunity to give remote engagement visibility to what's happening, just general updates for the community if possible. Do you, are there any questions today? There's more. Yes, sir. More than a question, it's probably more a comment, PJ. Um, you, you, you came into a process once you were started, but the way that we started with this process is to provide broadband services to the outlaying community. So it's interesting to me when you see places like San Luis and Somerton even giving you any brief at all. I mean, they should be more than ready to proceed. So I just wanted to, I wanted to get a sense of where we were. I mean, the city of Yuma has those services available. So I'm not really concerned about the city of Yuma. I am concerned about the outlaying areas and how fast we can get there and whether the governor's office is sort of playing, you know, the short game with us. Um, we, Personally, we met with the uh, governor's office, uh, I think it was back last week or the week before in Tucson. It was a pleasure to me to hear the smaller counties, Coconino and Santa Cruz, complain about Yuma getting all that money. Mm -hmm. It was actually a compliment, although it was done in front of the governor. But, uh, you know, it was still the response I found was positive from the governor's office, at least from the staff, that they were going to look into this and, 
expedite it as much as possible. I want to thank Paul Brindley. Uh, I call him Brinkley all the time, so Brindley. You know, something like that. Uh, you know, for you know, taking, you know, paying special attention to the needs of the farming community in Yuma County. I mean, they do, they are, if not the strongest pillar, one of the strongest pillars of our economy. So it's always nice to see that they get the, the proper attention they, they need and they want. Uh, so I just wanted to get a sense of where we're at. And I just want to reemphasize, our goal is to get this service out to the unlinked communities as fast as possible. Um, and on Halo's side of things, and let's not forget we're dealing with a lawsuit of some sort from the local vendors. So I'm very, very interested in making sure that those local vendors are involved in the process. Yes, sir. So they don't feel like we're doing this for Halo, that we're doing this for you know, everybody in Yuma County. So be cognizant of that when you proceed, PJ, and just make sure that it is truly open, a transparent process that everybody can participate because eventually what we want is those private sector uh, suppliers not to give us the beef about, you know, the market's too small. Right. You know, so we don't want to invest the money. That was the idea, and it's still the idea. I look forward to the day that Yuma County would be considered in the forefront of services to the outlying communities, especially given the fact that as the pandemic showed, we need to, this to be available to all residents of Yuma County, not just the residents of the larger market, which is what normally happens. So thank you very much for the explanation and the update. Is there anyone else from the board? I'll give you oh, from the board that wants to ask any questions. Thank you for all that you've done so far and catching us up. I especially like your haircut. That one, you know, <laughs> so Paul wanted to say something. So if you, if you just give him a space, because he's a big guy. Thank you. I just wanted to say a couple of things. As someone who's been on this from day one, um, we're really excited where this is going. Between the broadband middle mile that's going to going to entice ISPs to come, the last mile that's already going in, and the wireless network for agriculture that's underway. Um, and I want to thank you for hiring PJ. I mean, since he's come on, and I can't believe it's only been eight weeks, but this is really moving forward. He's really pushing on all the places they need to push, and the. Um, the funding that's available and will be available over the next couple of years is just unprecedented. And, and what I see is if if we're moving ahead and we're pushing on that, we're going to get an amazing infrastructure for the next 30 years or more. If we don't, other places are going to get that funding and, and we'll be left behind. So um, hiring PJ was really a great idea and it's going to keep things. Uh, Philip James. Philip James. Okay. How you, how you, how you, Philip James. So that's, thank you for that. I was in trouble at home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just want to thank you guys for all the support you've done and, and just say that we're on a great path and PJ is really going to help with that. So, yeah. Well, him working with our grant people, the two, the two of them together, it's going to, that's going to be a, a good team. That was the issue with him. So. <laughs> right, PJ, I don't think there's any more questions. We just wanted to sort of get an update on where you guys were at. And yes, sir. Sure that your eyes open to everything else. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Keep uh, up thank work. you very much. Uh, in the next item, thank you, Paul. In the next item is thank presentation you, of the county line by Yuma 77, the Yuma County Government Channel. I'm trying to speed it up, guys. <laughs> trying to speed, speed it up. After the last meeting where they ended at 10, I, I was just like, okay, what's going on? Here? Yuma County's 185 and 197 buildings have been reduced to ground level making way for new developments. First responders from near and far train to respond to potential ammonia leaks. And find out how you can become part of the Certified Emergency Response Team. These stories and more, this is your County Line. In February, Pilkington Construction commenced demolition of the structures 185 and 197 South Main Street to pave the way for the new Yuma County Administration Building. After almost two months, the structures have been completely taken down to ground level, leaving only debris and rubbish. Once the rubble is cleared, the project will move on to the building permit stage, which includes the construction package. As demolition's wrapping up, we're finalizing the construction plans for the new building. 
and after that we'll move into the site prep phase and we'll do some excavation for the new foundations and the new basement. If you're interested in monitoring the project yourself, you can visit yumacountyaz.gov. Click on the banner at the top of the Yuma County homepage and watch it live. We'll continue to keep you up to date as the project continues to move through its various phases. Yuma County's Emergency Management Team, in collaboration with the Environmental Protection Agency and the Arizona Emergency Response Team, conducted hazardous material safety training for first responders. The three-day ammonia safety course, held at Public Works and the North Gila Transfer Site, and organized by the Ammonia Safety and Training Institute, offered a unique combination of classroom experiences and hands-on training scenarios, including live ammonia drills. This is the first time ATSI has uh, come out of their uh, state of California, their facility, have a fixed facility. They came out and did this training here locally, and we've had an overwhelming response by those attending them. The participants included both local first responders and first responders from as far away as Canada. This training was a great opportunity for attendees to connect with the experts in the ammonia field. These types of trainings help first responders obtain the skills and knowledge needed to respond effectively in the event of an emergency, ensuring the safety of our community. The Community Emergency Response Program is offering a four-class session totaling 22 hours to educate individuals about disaster preparedness and basic disaster response skills. The program covers topics such as fire safety, light search and rescue, team organization, terrorism, and disaster medical operations. Using the skills learned during the classroom and during exercises, CERT volunteers can assist their community during disasters when professional responders are not immediately available. The program encourages volunteers to participate in emergency preparedness projects and support emergency response agencies. For more information about this program, interested individuals can call the Yuma County Office of Emergency Management at 928-317-4681. Hi, I'm Mary and this is your Health Watch. Bats are valuable to ecosystems for their role in pest control, pollination, and seed dispersal, but they can carry diseases, including rabies. Being nocturnal, bats typically avoid human contact, but those active during the day or displaying abnormal behavior may be sick with rabies. Although bats are not usually aggressive, they will bite in self-defense if provoked or handled. To protect your family and pets, teach children not to handle unfamiliar animals and avoid touching bats with bare hands. Keep pets up to date on their rabies vaccine and call a veterinarian or local health department if they come in contact with a bat. If unsure whether you have been bitten or scratched, consult a healthcare professional. For more information, contact the Yuma County Health District at 928-317-4550. That is all for now. Stay healthy, Yuma. Before we head out, the Yuma County Sheriff's Office has announced a detention officer testing day on April 12th. To be eligible for the position, applicants must have a high school diploma or equivalent a valid driver's license, and be at least 18 years old. The deadline to submit applications is April 9th. To register, visit yumacountysheriff.org forward slash employment.html or contact Human Resources at 928-539-7842. Thank you for joining us for this County Line. We'd like to know of any story ideas you may have. And if you're looking for stories we've covered in the past, log on to our website at yumacountyaz.gov forward slash VOD. We'll see you on the next County Line. Well, that was Tony, wasn't it? I think so, in that uniform. Yeah. Uh, well, is he here? No. Well, we, we've got to talk about him when we get to that section. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to the consent calendar, which is um, you know getting closer to the action items here. The consent calendar where the, the items are listed under the consent agenda will be considered as a group and acted upon by one motion with no separate discussion discussion unless a board member so requests. In that event, the item will be removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion and action. I am going to ask that item five be uh, you know separated so we can talk about it, and item six will be tabled. I don't think it's ready for us to take action, so unless 
a board member so desires, uh, you know, we I'm going to entertain a motion to table the item when we get to it. So I'm moving item five and six out of the consent calendar myself. Is there any other items that you'd like to remove? If not, then I'll entertain a motion to approve consent calendars items 10 through 12 with the exception of five, five and six. One through 12. One through 12 with the exception of five and six. So moved. Second. I a motion and second to approve the consent calendar with the exception of items five and six, which will be open for discussion individually. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Uh, so that uh, I'll, I'll op open up item number five, which is for kind of administration, is the action to distribute seven thousand and seven thousand dollars in program funding to, from the Cocoa Puffs Indian Tribe to the Coastal Mission and Catholic Community Savers State services safe house and equals amount in equal amounts of thirty five hundred dollars i do know that we do have a, a representative from the tribe this is rosa long mm -hmm. and uh you know I, every time i see sherry i have to sort of like toss a minute so you know that she's not here necessarily but you know you can thank her when you see her uh well you know this we we want to take the item out because it, we don't get to do this very often and we like to thank the tribe for allowing us to distribute the money in the community uh, I know that we do that a couple of times a year, but every time we do it, I think it feels, come in, come up, Rosa. And, the, and, and I do apologize for my humble shoes. I didn't get a chance to put oh, my see. heels on. Oh. <laughs> you a lot comfortable. You uh, lot comfortable. I'm in shorts right now. Yeah, are you? <laughs> you know, they, we don't get to do this very often. We are very appreciative when you guys do Yes, we love to help. And, and, you know, feel like we need to let the community know that you know, other than going to the casinos and uh, <laughs> our contribution that way, yes. you know, the tribe really returns a lot of that and services. All the, the tribes, community. all the tribes of Arizona, you know, that was part of our compact that we would share in the earnings that we receive. And that's being a good partner with our communities. Uh, every tribe of Arizona that has a casino shares their funding for their cities, transportation and education and uh, medical care that you all receive. It comes from casino a revenue. Bit of direction, you know, mm -hmm. what to do with the money. But as long as it goes out in the community and it helps mm -hmm. people in need, it does. That's why I really deserve mm -hmm. the recognition. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, have, I know Jonathan is back there because I, I recognized him from a long time ago. <laughs> we won't admit how long ago we known each other because if you can figure out the age. But um, thank you very much, Rosa, and thanks to Tribe for the contribution. I know that the, uh, I think the. The grocery admissions here, and I don't know if I've got Yes, and Safe House is also here. Oh, oh, there you are. Hey. <laughs> oh, this was unexpected. It was like, I think they follow Supervisor Frank Percy's lead when they want to do this. So we're going to go up in front and sort of take the check or issue the check. And those two recipients, would you please step up so we can take a picture? Oh. Thank you, guys. Come on. I try to put it in my account. <laughs> <laughs> 
Got to make up for all that money. To, that, uh, you can erase it with check. You can erase it with anything on it. Thank you very much. Bye, Russell. See you guys later. So we're clearing the room as fast as we can. So the next item is the county administration construction manager management, um, and it's to authorize the acquisition. Sure, of the Mr. Property. Chairman, okay. yeah. forgive the interruption. We oh, need a motion. We yes. All right. So we, let's approve item number five as presented. So move. Second. second. Motion and second to approve item five as presented. All those in favor of the motion signify by stating aye. Aye. There's no discussion. So. All right. We'll move on to county administration construction management to authorize the acquisition of real property located on the southern portion of the property at 111 South Main Street, as described in attached exhibit A, as a as per appraised value of 35,612 by purchase or condemnation. It is my understanding. Come on. It is my understanding that uh, that isn't ready. That the owner has a different idea, and that we need to discuss it with him. If we get into discussion, this is going to take time i just wanted to i don't know if we're not ready to make a decision on it so i'll entertain a motion to table the item until the next scheduled meeting or until it's ready is mm -hmm. that okay are you is it ready chairman reyes uh, members of the board we do not have a final agreement with the owner yet we're in negotiation still uh is it okay if we discuss it or is it, is it better if we table the item until it's ready because if we discuss it we're going to make a decision either yes or no or table it. Chairman, the item's been agendized for purposes of discussion and possible action. So oh. it's up to the pleasure of the board if they want to continue or. He's, um, Dave, he's not willing to sell it for the appraised value. There you go. We'll all open it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we opened it up. Huh? I, 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 I <laughs> not yet had a de definitive answer to that question. Uh, we are in discussions. We have presented the options. You might recall when I was here in February, we discussed three scenarios, purchase, uh, condemnation, or an easement. And he has come back and expressed his desire to maintain ownership of the property and, and to look at the easement option. I have uh, come back to him and simply you know, reminded him of the, the scenario. This is what this slide is for. Again, to show a couple areas where a building is designed with uh, uh, portions that actually project over the existing property line. Uh -huh. And um, and again, we had the issues with the fire separation distance and wanting to maintain some separation between the buildings and uh, 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 for the, you know, the foreseeable future. So what we we're concerned that you, you have this drawing in your packet and what we were discussing is a possible combination of easement area over the majority of this area. Mm -hmm. And just the very southern portion where we do have that encroachment issue would, would be a purchase. Uh, that represents an area of approximately 390 square feet. So that's been presented as, a, as a, an option back to them, and we're just waiting to hear if that's it. I would say that our, our discussions have been uh, productive, and I do believe we'll arrive at a mutually beneficial um, scenario. As far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't feel comfortable building without having, you know, I think it's the same issue with him. He just... You know, he just wants to have control, ownership of the portion that he needs for his operation. And it's the same way with us. So if you can find a way to accommodate his request to basically control that area, it's fine with us. But, you know, we like to have the same opportunity. And, and it's because we're building a $50 million building next to it. And we certainly mm -hmm. don't want to be locked into a situation where we can't have access from that side. For whatever reasons, I mean, even... Even for, if for purposes of emergency, reaching the location from the side, you need to have that. In an easement, it's okay, but it's not necessarily yeah. what we look at. Right. We'll do, do as much as, you know, uh, spend as much money as we're going to spend on that building. So if you can find a way to accommodate his problem or his desire with us getting ownership of that portion that we need and easements on the other side or, you know, whatever, uh, bring it back to us for a final decision, okay? So... Uh, let us send a motion to table the item until it's ready to be decided I will by it. Table the item and for further discussion. I'll so second. Then a motion and second to table the item for further discussion at a later date. All those in favor of the motion signify by stating aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, David, for the update. Um, and now we move into discussion and action items. And the first one is discussion and possible action regarding updates on contagious and facial diseases, issues, and activities to include a discussion of events and activities occurring at the international border that involve, wait a minute, yeah, involve or affect county health and emergency management. I just, I've forgotten how lengthy the, the item become, became after the attorney got through it. 
can't discuss anything now without having it in the agenda. But anyway, Diana, Ms. Gomez. Uh, good morning, members of the board. Diana Gomez, Director of Public Health. So our, our numbers, our flu or influenza, our RSV, and our COVID numbers continue to be trending downward. So that's a good scenario for us. Um, overall, our um, community transmission level remains low. So um, we're definitely moving in the right direction, which is good news considering we have a high level of activity in our community. Um, you saw our um, health watch focusing on bats. Um, that was because there's a lot of bat activity. Um, bats usually want to be left alone. And the reason we did that PSA is because we had different encounters of people approaching bats and being scratched by bats. So they may look cute when they're out, but if they're out and about, it, especially during the day, leave them alone. Um, they do not want to be handled. And sometimes it's well-meaning people that find a bat on the floor and they want to pick it up and put it up on the tree or, or wherever. And they, of course, you know, the, the bat will retaliate. So that's why it was a high percentage of, of people coming in contact and getting scratched. And again if they're family. out during the day, they yeah. have rabies. Leave them alone if they're out during the day. They, they want to be left alone either way. But if you do become, you know, if you are scratched or you become in contact with one of them, please call your health care provider. Call Animal Control. Um, we want to know about it. Like those three bats were sent away for, for testing. And sometimes people think they want to, you know, help the bat. And ultimately, the only way to test for rabies is through a um, autopsy. So you have to euthanize the bat. So you're not really helping the bat. Um, so again, that's why that was there, which again brings me to another thing. We're all enjoying the weather. Everybody's out. We're all, you know, outside. It's, it's been really nice weather lately. We've gotten a lot of calls to our animal control um, department with dogs at large. Um, so just a reminder that your dog, if you're out there enjoying a park or a walk in your neighborhood, it needs to be on a leash. Um, we don't want your dog, even if you have a very well-behaved dog, we don't want him darting out into the street or darting out to other people. And we've gotten a lot of calls with dogs at large. So just a reminder, we want your pet to be safe. Um, and you know, we have a lot of encounters where even really friendly dogs will walk up to people and get excited, not you know, knock people over um, small children. So just a reminder that you know, parks and community neighborhoods, sidewalks are for all of us to enjoy. So just have that courtesy, even if you have it, like I said, a really well-behaved dog and and be mindful check your gates check you know we don't want your pet getting out animal control um, goes to great lengths to reunite you with your pet we you know the, the officers will go around and try to figure out especially if it's microchip get it back to the owner the first um, that's the first thing we try to do is reunite the pet we don't want to you know um, take it to the shelter or anywhere else if we can do that but again a reminder I think um, it's just it's we've just gotten an increased number of calls on that so just want to remind the public you know it's tough to look really tough with a with a little chihuahua which is <laughs> what i have but it, he believes it's a pit bull so it's tough to control him i don't think he'll knock anyone down but you know it's really i, I took him to get his rabies shot i mean there was a bunch of people showing off their bull, the pit bulls and all the huge dogs and i'm trying to look tough with the chihuahua which doesn't work <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I, hey, they're the, the ones you got to watch out for. They're so small, the little ankle biters. Yeah. Yeah. Get you. So don't it's dog. a safety don't thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a safety <laughs> thing for your dog too. You know, you don't want you know you don't want another dog to react poorly to it. All right. Uh -huh. I, I just had a question for Diana. I'm sitting there looking at the weather. We're supposed to be in the mid to upper 90s this time next week. Have we started making plans for cooling centers and, and places where we can do water distribution? Just and, make so we have that information on our website, and it's actually our preparedness um, division that deals with that. But um, yeah, we start doing, well, you'll start hearing PSAs about being outside in the weather and being prepared um, for that. So we'll, we'll take a look at it, make sure it's updated. Uh, and I know we had partnered with the library at some point to hand out, you know, the, the refillable water bottles, the cooling towels. We'll, we'll, look, at, we'll look at that again. Go ahead, finish it up. Oh, no. Uh, can you bring Tony up, Tony Badia? There's something I want to talk to you both together about. Uh oh. You look great as a movie star, Tony, but you know. I'm available for autographs. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, as right. member of the board, Tony Badia. The reason I wanted you two together is uh, you know, I was in Washington last week, and, and there was a lot of discussion about COVID 19 and the pandemic. And, and the discussion was centered about how we use the lessons we learned to prepare for the next one. 
because you know they, 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 they keep repeating this COVID, uh, you know, we're done with COVID, but COVID isn't done with us type of thing. And what came out of that meeting was the fact that a lot of the organizations, a lot of the county, we're, we're so tired from hearing COVID that we are not understanding that it could happen again. And so the lessons learned are lost because we really don't use them to prepare for the next problem, health problem that we may have, or pandemic of other kind, of other sort. So the question for me, and I know you guys are have prepared a plan in case of an emergency, but are we, are we preparing for what could possibly be our next experience uh, as a county? Yes, um, at least in, in I, I know Tony and will share this. We we don't think about if something's going to happen. We think about when it's going to happen. And we had actually just done a big tabletop exercise, right? And we had mm -hmm. happened to do it with a, with at AWC, and then we got the call about our first case the following day. So um, you always assume um, internally, at least, and then there's partners. And Tony can speak more to that, but. You know, we deal with the clinical partners, and, and Tony basically um, coordinated a lot of the activities with the first responders. So for us, it's not a matter of if, it's when. And so you take what you learn, and then you kind of anticipate what the next thing coming will be. To me, Mr. Chairman, have yeah. we requested new phone systems, updated phone systems so that we can call in and... For the lines, like yeah. when we had the call-in numbers? Oh, my gosh, that was a nightmare. Oh, no. I, I, I was going to follow up with a comment about emergency preparedness. Um, the, the, and it comes from Oakland, actually Oakland, California, where they were actually preparing for earthquakes because that was the kind of emergency they, they were looking forward to. But they created this team of people that would respond in case of an, emer an emergency, which was well used during the pandemic to communicate with all kinds of sections. The community was made up of a lot of different members. It, to me, provided us a, 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 a sort of a, a guide of, of what to do in case of an emergency for a city that was prepared to handle something else, an emergency. Because we, we tend to think of an emergency as different emergencies. We tend to think of an emergency as an earthquake or we don't, we here don't think much about a flood or anything that's going to stop us from doing what we normally do. But, uh, you know, we are also, we're, we're a border community. We've got certain issues and obviously the pandemic proved that it doesn't have to be a physical emergency. It doesn't have to be a fire. It doesn't have to be something like that. It can be something totally unexpected that takes us, you know, to down a path that we've never been. So, you know, it's nice to hear from both of you. And I, I'd like the community in general to know that the county is prepared for any kind of emergency, including a health emergency, including some of the emergencies that we deal with. I want to commend both of you at the same time for the response that we had to the health crisis, but not for just only, but because you bring people like the ammonia uh, team that came and prepared us because you do tabletop exercises because some of us travel to other places to get this, to become more ready uh, for any kind of emergency. And I think that's special from you in Yuma County because I hear from all the counties where they ask me about what are you guys doing out there? And I always say, we've got the best prepared people in the world. Now, I may be exaggerating a little bit, but the point that I'm making is that uh, we're certainly lucky to have you guys around to prepare for this type of things because people don't think about those things until they happen to them. Right, and, and you got to understand that we have an emergency operations center. We can bring personnel in there. We can bring 10 people. We can bring 60 people in there. And a lot of times some of the players don't always play because we may not need them. But like with the COVID pandemic, obviously would have been a health uh, department rela heavy related incident. Uh, but. We plan for not. You mentioned we don't worry about the floods. We do worry about those things. We worry about multi hazards, so we plan for all that and we train for all that. And that's like you're talking about the ammonia. That's an example because, yeah. you know, when it rains, it does fly down the foothills. And we don't we don't normally expect hurt um, tornadoes here, but they've been in Arizona several times, numerous times. There's been tornadoes, fortunately, maybe not in Yuma, but uh, they do happen, and we we think about those things. And uh, snowstorms, eh, we're probably not going to have that, but. Uh, you know, we, oh, up I don't want to be sorry to open this up. I just wanted to make sure that you know. Watch. If members of the community want to be better prepared to respond so they can help their families, their neighbors, you have that CERT training, which mm -hmm. actually prepares you to respond to a variety of emergencies, right? right? Take care of themselves, their mm -hmm. family, and their neighbors, and then if we need them, they can come out and help the community. Unfortunately, you two have been your own worst enemy during this whole thing because you have set the bar so high and in the job that you did 
that your yourself is going to be a tough act to follow if something else happens. But and you know it's it's a uh, uh, employee appreciation month and a lot of the employees came together and did a lot of this stuff and then the community itself, all the partners mm -hmm. that Diana has, we have at the local level, tribal level, mm -hmm. and then we moved on to the state level and then the federal level. They they all supported this this response that we had over the COVID and they continue to support those things. So it's really important to understand you know everybody has to get involved in that and, and we're very fortunate to have a lot of those people that came to help us as well to make the county and, and, and community safe. All right. Other than that lab fest, is there any other questions? No. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, oh wait a minute before you leave I heard that this is going to be moved to a quarterly report every three months. Yeah. That's correct. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, after May 11th, when the what is it, the, the federal COVID emergency expires, this will move to a quarterly general health update. Well, yes. I want you to know you'll be on call anyway. I, yeah, I, I will be on call, and I'm always happy to come provide updates on. Put a, a it's a Monday morning thing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tony. Tony. Thank you very much. Real quick question for Tony: Have you heard anything about uh, the Gila running? Yes, the, the Gila has an, had an increase in water. I know Public Works, I've been on the phone with them, talked to them a couple times. They're preparing some of their areas. I, I didn't realize some of their areas. We haven't had the Gila like that. I know they're time, looking at they cutting road several road roads. roads. They're preparing for that. Mm -hmm. um, I get reports on the Colorado all the time, but I rarely ever get anything from the Gila. But I did get uh, an email the other day that they are uh, expecting some increase in, in water. Uh, I, I don't know how soon we'll see that. Meeting? but. Public Works is checking out. Not a meeting the year. I was here present when it flooded. Mm -hmm. When actually yeah. Highway 95, yeah. you know, the water went over Highway 95. Right. And the bridge that goes over to YPG. I worked 93. I worked at 12 on, 12 off for months. You guys were aware of the county stuff. I was aware of the city stuff. When we drove up and down the levees looking for the, uh, the gopher holes to leak and things like that where the water was really high back then. Well, let's not get in there. But anyway, we were just, I just kind of wanted to bring it up so we can make sure we're, you know, working with public works. Well, not only the Gila, but we're also going to see an increase in the Colorado River as well. So that's where it meets with us, what we had back in 95. But we're, hopefully we're not going to get to Mexico or that bridge over there. I think Mexico I have a few water in here. Mexico will get plenty of water. That's for All sure. All right. Okay. Well, All thank right. you very much, guys. Right. Appreciate it. I was only given until 10, but I think we're running over. So we're going to move on to development service, the planning and division review and approval of the annual report for calendar year 2022. There will be a PowerPoint presentation, Mike. So, Chairman, that's up to you. Yes, it's good. I saw it. I, I read it. This Yes, yes. Yes, Maggie Castro, Planning and Zoning Director. This is the annual report for um, calendar year 2022. The report um, is divided into three uh, sections or four sections. The Planning and Zoning Division, the Building Safety Division, Environmental Programs Division, and the Permit uh, Services Division. So uh, this table is a summary of the um, uh, activities for the planning section. In calendar year 2022, there was uh, approximately a 6% increase in the overall level of activity compared to calendar year 2021, and a 51% um, increase in activity compared to five years ago. So uh, for last year, we're, uh, there wasn't much of a difference, but uh, if you look at 2018, there was oops, uh, a big difference in the actual activity. I think 2021 was sort of like the year that some, you know, the, the land division, a lot of people did things, you know, because they had nothing else to do. Mm. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the, this map um, shows where activity took place. It shows um, major amendments, minor amendments, special use permits, subdivisions, variances, and rezonings. So you can tell uh, there's a cluster of activity in the Foothills planning area, and then also uh, a significant, significant amount of activity in the uh, uh, Yuma Mesa planning area. And then there's a cluster of activity in the Northwest Yuma planning area. Uh, in calendar year 2022, there was one uh, major amendment, two minor amendments, 17 rezoning cases, seven spe special use permits approved, 10 variance cases, and two final plats approved for the calendar year. <clears throat> there were four amendments that were approved in uh, 
calendar year 2022. One was the adoption of the Yuma Bikeways Master Plan. Uh, then there was a change to the circulation element to change the uh, Foothills bicycle routes. There was a change to um, the fence heights in um, uh, residential and uh, RA zoning districts. And then there was also an amendment to the uh, Comprehensive Building Safety Code. Uh, this table shows the amount, number of projects that were approved by uh, the Planning and Zoning Division. In 2022, there was a decrease of almost 16% in the amount of uh, permits and projects that, re that were reviewed by planning staff. Uh, and um, it, that's compared to 2021. Uh, compared to uh, 20, 2018, five years ago, there was a 27% increase in the number of permits reviewed. Uh, I think, I, again, I think it has a lot to do with things that were built up. You know, they, they were building up to a point, then they happen, and then it kind of settled a little bit. I think 2022 was a settlement year. That's where we started to see some settle. And then, obviously, the last part of the year was a little slow. Yes. Mr. Chairman, uh, staff also p participates in uh, outreach activity throughout the year. In uh, 2022, there was uh, staff uh, held a neighborhood meeting for the major amendments. That was held on September 18th. There was an open house meeting uh, also held for the 2030 Comprehensive Plan. That was held on <clears throat> November 16th. And then um, uh, the planning director and the deputy zoning inspector had the opportunity to participate in uh, several community forums, one, some for the Avenue B and C Colonia, and then one for the Orange Grove uh, area. Uh, in addition to the uh, outreach activity that staff participates in, uh, staff uh, meet, the staff members meet with uh, staff on a regular basis at the counter and over the phone. Um, also participated in 69 project assessment, assessment meetings where uh, staff has the opportunity to educate um, the customers and applicants on zoning ordinance requirements, processes, timelines, and submittal requirements. And then uh, staff also uh, provide communication during the zoning violation process where we take the opportunity to uh, educate uh, those that are uh, sent courtesy no notices of violation about uh, the zoning ordinance and uh, how to remedy the specific zoning violations. The zoning enforcement activity, um, there was an increase of approximately 20% in total complaints received in 2022 compared to 2021, an increase in uh, six, of 67% uh, compared to last year, and an increase of 17% in total cases initialized compared to last year. This map shows where zoning violation activity is taking taking place. Again, mm -hmm. the majority of the activity takes place in the Foothills planning area. And then there's a cluster, cluster of activity in the Northwest Yuma planning area, and then some scattered throughout the, the remainder of the county. Can you go back to the map before that. That one. Is that is that an island? Is that a county island that I see in the middle of San Luis? That white part. Is that a white part? Mm -hmm. It's a prison. Yes, that's the uh, large yes. one. Okay. No, I just, I, it looks a little odd. You know, we <laughs> normally don't like to see county islands in the middle of you know developed areas. We see a county island. So when I saw that, I. You know, I, I thought, okay, well, how do we allow that to happen? We should allow the city to basically surround something. Yeah. That's the, pr the prison. That's prison. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we can dismiss that component. <laughs> For the Building Safety Division, um, there was a 14% um, decrease in construction valuations and a 38% increase in um, construction valuations. The decrease happened uh, from in comparison to last year, in comparison to five years ago, there was a 38% 30, increase. Increase? Yeah, to five years ago. 
-hmm. To last year, there's a decrease in construction valuations of approximately 14%. Uh, there was a 35% decrease in single-family residential permits and an increase of 38% compared to last year. So there was decrease in mm -hmm. uh, single-family residential, slight uh, decrease, but an increase from five years ago. This, is, uh, this map shows where the uh, construction activity uh, took place. Again, vast majority in uh, the Foothills planning area, and then another uh, cluster here in the Northwest Yuma planning area, area, and then significant activity in the Northwest Yuma planning area. Hmm. For the em environmental programs division, <clears throat> there was a uh, slight decrease in permits received, uh, significant increase in uh, septic tank permits issued, a slight increase in septic, temp se sep septic permits finaled, <clears throat> uh, a 52% uh, de decrease in site evaluations, a decrease in um, pumper hauler inspections, and an increase in up to 37% in the uh, general permit <clears throat> sewage collection system construction authorization. And uh, for the Permit Services Division, we are continuing with the uh, implementation of the new software program that was uh, that started in back in 2020. We are still making upgrades and trying to fine tune the program to make it easier for customers and the general public to be able to access information about permits without having to call staff. They can um, uh, access the information online. Uh, also, it allows field personnel to access information and, and update permit um, or inspection activity when they're out in the field and access the information directly from, from their mobile devices. And Mr. Chairman, that concludes uh, the presentation. I just want to make a comment before we you know, finish it up, and that is that we, you know, I just skipped over that. There was there have been a, a lot of complaints lately, and I just wanted to commend the department for handling those complaints. And you know, we we talked about that, and you know, mostly led by Supervisor Sumner you know, about how long it took to get through a complaint, public nuisance complaint, and how you know we sort of squeezed the time a little. Uh, to get some of these things done a little faster and allow the department to take a more aggressive action, uh, which means sometimes taking people to court. But at, at the end, eventually, I think the fact that uh, the, the, the BNC Colonia people feel like at least you guys are taking care of them a lot faster. Some of those complaints are used to linger on for months, if not years. And the department has made sure that, uh, you know, that, that those complaints are taken care of faster. And I think that's what people notice. I mean, that your report is pretty uh, complete, but people notice things like, okay, are we, are, we, are we getting these complaints done faster? Is it, is it getting done? And I think that's probably the, the, comment, the area where I get the most comments on about, you know, people complain about the complaints, but in reality, <laughs> that's, just, that's just what we're asking you to do. You know, take mm -hmm. a little more, pay more attention to those complaints and get them done faster. And I, so I want to, you know, I want you to convey to your department that you know, although we sometimes complain about the complaints, we notice that uh, you guys are taking care of those fast. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd, I'd like to thank Maggie. I sent her quite a few, and she's very <laughs> quick to respond, and I appreciate that. So, and, and now that that said, before you slip away, I got something I need to. <laughs> I already sent you an email on this one, but I wanted to give you the letter I got. So, <laughs> it's not included in the agenda, but we'll allow that to happen. Yeah. But thank you for thank you very much, all guys. the work you guys do. Right. So on that note, again, we'll move on to the planning and zoning agenda. Um, you know, we have uh, fully. Give the interruption. We do need a motion. Oh, we do need a motion to accept the plan. Exactly. Right. So I'll, moved. I'll second. There's been a motion and a second to accept the plan as presented. Um, the annual report for calendar year 2020. Thank All you. Right. So uh, there's been a motion, a second. Any discussion on the item? If not, all those in favor signify by saying, uh, stating aye. 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 A
motion carries and we now move on to the planning and zoning agenda um uh, well full legal description of the property size so for always when cases are available for public review at the yuma county board of supervisors office we do have an expedited agenda which means that the items will be open at the group for a public hearing and acted upon by one motion to adopt the recommendation of the planning and zoning commission except for any item that's removed by a board member for separate Consideration the item will be discussed and acted upon separately following action on expedited items. There are three items that were approved by the board. They're relatively small. Uh, so, you know, unless a board uh, member has a specific item that they'd like to discuss, I'd like to take them on as a group. Hold on. There was one. I don't know if it's the, the expedited one. Comment. Yeah, I know. I know yeah. I need to open it, but I wanted to make sure that the board had a chance to ask any questions and see if they want to separate one or not before we go into public hearing. This, no. Okay, so uh, we're going to do this expedited. Uh, so I'm going to open all three items. Item one is a special use permit number 2211. Item two is minor amendment case number 2208. And then the rezoning case 2227, which are related to each other. Um, I am going to open it to the public hearing. We, I don't think we have any questions. Um, we see what's in the agenda. So I'm going to open this to a public hearing. And does anybody in the public want to talk about any of these items? Remembering that if it's a consent item, you're already winning. No problems? Okay, then I'm going to close the public hearing and return it back to the board for their decision. I'll entertain a motion to open, to um, uh, 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 accept. Approve. approve. Yeah. To approve all three expedited, uh, expedited cases as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion a second to approve the expedited items as presented. Well, we know this. Is there any discussion? I guess not. All those in favor of the motion signify by stating aye. 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 Right. opposed? The motion carries. That so, was easy. That one, that one was easy. <laughs> so the next one is development services. This is a regular public hearing item. Uh, staff will make a full presentation of each of the following items, followed by separate discussion, public hearing, and action by the board uh, or supervisors. This is public hearing rezoning case number 2228, Christmas Robbins, HM4 Maha LLC, requests the rezoning of a parcel 50,000 square feet in size from manufacturing home subdivision 10,000 square feet minimum, minimum and low density residential 20,000 square feet minimum to manufacturing home subdivision. 6,000 square feet minimum. Assessor's parcel located on the south side of Columbia Avenue, approximately 800 east of Summer Street, Yuma, Arizona. Uh, do you want to start us off with the PowerPoint? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Juan Landrubio, Senior Plan with the Planning and Zone Division. Uh, before we continue, I just want to let you know that uh, the staff would like to request that the, this meeting be continued to the April 17th uh, board hearing. Due to some unforeseen circumstances, uh, statutory requirements for public notifications were not met. So the applicant and the agent were informed. Uh, they're okay with uh, having this meeting continue to the April 17th. So it's continued. And that's what I was searching for the last time. It's either table or continued to a specific date. I move that we table this to the next meeting. You want to continue it? To the next meeting. The next schedule, yeah. which will be when? April 17th. April 17th. April 17th. April 17th. April 17th. Okay, so this item you're asking for us to continue to the April 17th meeting. Uh, there's been a motion. Is there a second? There's been a second to continue this item to a, a, a date certain of April 17th. Um, any discussion on the item? If not, all those in favor of that motion. Wait, can I have a discussion on the item? Oh, you can't. I mean, that's what we tabled it and postponed it. You can't discuss we do it? That, we... You can discuss it. Okay. Okay, good. But let do you me think take back... we can get those... those um, illegal blockages so that the people can get to their property uh, mr okay. chairman by the time we get to april 17th uh, we have been in discussion the staff has been in discussion with uh the the county engineer to come up with uh solutions and options to present to you uh on september uh i'm, I'm sorry on april 17th as far as uh road blockages that uh, exist on uh, glen avenue yeah. Even though the, the subject, the property uh, on this rezoning case is actually uh, access off of Columbia Avenue, there's been some concerns from property owners uh, that have access off of Glen Avenue about existing uh, road blockage uh, that have existed over many, many years. So the staff has been in conversation with the county engineer. Uh, so we will have something, uh, options uh, prepared for you for the uh, April 17th meeting. And and have taxes been paid on this? Because I, I I don't think they have. 
before you split it. That's something that staff can look into. Uh, will the uh, check with the assessor's office for the for the April seventeenth meeting? These are when unsophisticated buyers don't use title companies, and I'm always afraid. Big subdivisions, I don't worry about. Little tiny splits like this, I worry about. This is this is this says uh, that it will be turned into. It, 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 the, the zoning is for um, a change from from parts of 50,000 square feet size to manufacturing home subdivision, 10,000 square feet. No, so, 6,000. Will, oh, 6,000. Okay. Oh, yeah, manufacturing home subdivision, 6,000. 6, so yeah. how does that yeah. work? Is it big enough to actually divide it into six parts? Yeah. It's, it, no, it's interesting. Chairman, the property would be uh, is rezoned to MHS 6, manufacturing home subdivision, 6,000 square foot minimum. It would allow the existing property to be split in half. That, that's what, all right. See. So it's not going to fall into subdivision no. regulations. It's, it's already just the a zone subdivision. Split. All right, got it. Got it. Yeah. And those are what I worry about. Okay. All right. Any mm -hmm. uh, any other comments, questions? If not, I'll, I'll vote the motion to thank you to continue to the next board meeting with those issues being addressed by then. All those in favor of the motion, please by stating aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Motion carries, and we'll move on to the discussion regarding legislative issues. Thank you very much, everybody, for Chairman, your patience. Just yes? to confirm for the public, that's April 17th. April 17th. Continue to the April 17th meeting. Thank you. So we'll move on to county administration, discussion, and possible action regarding state and federal legislative updates, which may include international issues, status of bills affecting Yuma County, timelines, and composition of the legislatures, and legislative strategies and priorities. Alejandro. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Alejandro Figueroa, Economic Development and Intergovernmental Affairs. So I'll be presenting to you the legislative update. I'll start by uh, sharing with you that the last Friday, March 31st, uh, Governor Hobbs announced uh, the reorganization of her leadership team. Changes include Will Gaona will serve as the governor's deputy chief of staff. Jennifer Loreto will serve as the, the director of policy, legislative and intergovernmental affairs. Tracy Lopez will serve as the Director of Community and Constituent Engagement, and a new Director of Communications will be announced this week. Mm -hmm. We'll be on to the legislature, and I'm sorry I was having, I rushed down from my office. I was not expecting the last item to be. <laughs> you didn't think it was going to be so quick, huh? Uh, so more than 82 days of session have gone by, and while there were uh, fifth. 1,528 bills introduced in both chambers. Only 37 have made it to the governor's desk. She has signed 17 of them and vetoed 20. Mm -hmm. Last week was the final week for committees to hear bills in the op opposite chamber of origin. The exception to the rule is the appropriations committees that will meet this week. The House Appropriations Committee will meet today, while the Senate's uh, committee will be taking place tomorrow. If a bill does not receive a hearing, it is considered dead for the re remainder of the legislative session. Uh, the reality is that uh, strikers can happen now. Um, and there are two types of striker bills that may take place at the appropriations. Uh, one is the, uh, the first one is the strikers that are yet, are yet another venue for bills that have been trying and failing to get through the hearing process for the first three months of the year. The second type of strikers are more difficult to predict. These, the product of extensive behind the scenes negotiations but little public action, can be dropped at the last moment with little to no warning of their arrival. So this is the last chance for lobbyists and members of the House and the Senate to have their Senate, their bills heard, uh, or any chances of having them pass through either chamber. On March 30th, I'm happy to share with you that the Senate's Natural Resources, Energy, and Water Committee members unanimously recommended HB 2669 for due pass as amended, with six members voting in favor of the bill and one uh, not attending the committee hearing, um, so didn't vote. The bill, as it has passed the House, included a blanket ban on biosolid application within three miles of a zone with a population density of 128 individuals per square mile, and within one mile of a crop produced uh, for human consumption. Chairwoman Care uh, um, amendment uh, removed this portion of the bill The municipalities such as the city of Mesa and the town of Gilbert found problematic. Opposing parties reached out to Representative Dunn 
to express their concern and that this bill could substantially increase their costs. And as a result, the section in this amendment is entirely removed. Nevertheless, Representative Dunn will be taking, will be talking to Speaker Tilma to create an ad hoc committee, study committee to explore this issue further. And we hope to have a seat at the table so we are part of the discussion. So the distance section portion of the bill will be moved to an ad hoc study committee for further discussion. We don't have any data to support that, that three miles would be enough, you know, for the smells and or flies uh, to still be an issue for our residents. Uh, HB 2669, as amended, takes important steps towards addressing the issues in Yuma County by requiring domestic septage to be treated to the same standards of, as biosolids. If, like biosolids, it will be applied to land. Further, it specifies that biosolids mixed with waste, like commercial waste, cannot be land applied and must be treated as solid, as solid waste. These are both issues that we have experienced in Yuma County according to development services and have generated most of the environmental nuisance reported by Yuma County residents such as smells and flies. I believe that this bill is a step in the right direction as it is responsive to our residents' concerns while simultaneously codifying best practices to the benefit of Yuma County. I would like to uh, give some special thanks to, I don't know if George made it, but special thanks to Representative Dunn, the CSA, as well as Craig, uh, Sellers and George Amaya from Development Services for their Is that support. George down there in the That's corner? George right there, uh -huh. testifying. Yes, he did a great job. So, um, this help, this bill will help pathogen reduction and pollutants uh, concentration. Uh, biosol would have to be certified for land application, especially when domestic septage are mixed with biosolids. We're on our way. Now it passed, so it's headed to the governor's office, correct? It's headed to the Senate floor. Oh, the floor first. Yeah, yeah. And, then and then it the will go to office. back to the House okay. for their approval. Mm -hmm. But we, it's all looking good. It was bipartisan support, fully bipartisan support on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. The U.S. Treasury opened up a portal today in an effort to assist counties as they prepare to submit an ARPA and a state and local coronavirus fiscal recovery fund project an expenditure report by April 30th. Um, also on March 29, the U.S. Senate passed H.J. Resolution 27, a joint resolution for disapproval under the Congressional Review Act of the Biden administration's Waters of the U.S. rule by a vote of 53 to 43. The U.S. House of Representatives had previously passed the same resolution on March 9th. Now that both chambers have passed the resolution, it heads to the president's desk, who has stalled he'll who has stated he will veto it. However, if Congress votes to override the veto, the resolution will block the uh, rule and revert to pre-2015 regulations. The definition of the waters of the U.S. rule directly impacts county governments as owners and operators of local infrastructure. Depending on whether certain water meets, depending on whether certain water meets the definition of the rule, counties may need to apply for a federal permit to maintain or build new infrastructure. Counties have long advocated for clarity and consistency with regard to the rule in order to reduce delays to critical infrastructure projects. On the international front. Before you leave, yes, sir. Before you leave the federal. Yes, sir. There is a PM10 hearing or a, a zone, ozone, whatever it is. Uh, it's a, the, the air quality hearing that, I mean, at least it was in the paper. I think it was yesterday, the day before yesterday, dealing with PM10, and they mentioned Yuma as one of those areas that really can do very little more than what we're doing to keep our PM10 uh, levels from reaching the levels that attracts the EPA attention. I know that Supervisor Pancras has been working on this for a while, and I didn't want to miss the opportunity to make sure that our congressmen, I think all of them, support the fact that there are some regulations that we cannot comply just simply because we, we're at the border area with Mexico and California. And uh, even though farming in Yuma County has become very sophisticated farming, the dust production is nil, we still have the dunes next to us and we still have Mexico and the ozone trucks that come from California or diesel trucks that come from California that affect the ozone layer. And that puts us in a situation where we can't really help much or do much to stop that. If we get the wind blowing the wrong way, we're done. If those testing stations really record that, we're, we're, there's nothing else we can do uh, other than covering the testing stations, which I think is illegal. So, you know, I just want to keep that. I just want to keep that in mind when we 
when we talk about federal legislation, because I think that we sometimes, because it's not a continuous problem, because we're not dealing with it all the time, only when, like the waters of the USA, it becomes an issue when, if, for example, the water is when the water is running. So it becomes an issue for us when the air is un unhealthy. But it, it's a situation that we don't want to come back and bite us. So I just want to keep that on the burner here, you know, as one of those issues we need to talk about every once in a while to see with our legislators, especially senators and especially Democratic senators and uh, our representation in Congress. Um, all congressmen and senators should be aware that we are one of those, you know, impacted. I think it was Mary Peters that testified about Arizona being mm -hmm. one of those states that was continuous and that could do very little to to impact um, ozone uh, readings or PM10 readings, which in this case, I think Yuma County has to deal with all the time. Okay, Alex, I didn't want you to leave that. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yuma County staff continues to work with ADQ to produce a, a SIP, state implementation plan that will be uh, submitted to EPA for their review and mm -hmm. approval. Okay, good. And you're the one who's been the key person, you and Craig, huh? Correct, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. On the international front, Governor Hobbs met with the Arizona Border Counties Coalition to discuss policies and issues that affect the quality of life and economy along the border. Supervisor Tony Reyes attended that meeting in representation of Yuma County. After that same meeting, that same day, uh, Governor Hobbs traveled with the Department of Homeland Security Secretary, Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas to Arizona's southern border in Nogales to meet with Border Patrol agents. Uh, humanitarian aid organizations and to tour the Mariposa port of <coughs> entry. Uh, unfortunately, I'd also like to report that um, 38 people were killed as a fire broke out in Mexico at a ne Mexico's National Migration Center in Ciudad Juarez uh, that borders El Paso. Uh, authorities on Tuesday uh, last week believe the fire was caused by a protest initiated uh, by some of the migrants detained at the center. Dozens more, dozens more were uh, people. People were injured, 29 of whom were taken to, uh, to four hospitals in serious condition. Um, 68 men from Central America and South America, mainly Venezuela, were being held at the facility at the time. Right on the, on the, on the border issue, um, the, the, um, the state is taking a different tack. I mean, I did, we did meet with the governor. In different tack, I mean, he, she's not as focused on whatever's happening at the border as the former uh, governor was. She, you know, and I do want to thank uh, uh, Sheriff, uh, what's his last name? Ogden. Or, uh, no. Oh, Wilma. Oh, sorry. Uh, I am Wilma. sorry. Wilma. Wilma. I'm I sorry, to, Wilma. I Boy, that. A lot of information right, specifically yeah. on the, um, on the uh, National Guard presence over here and how it assists law enforcement and the need to keep some of those. Uh, keep some of those uh, law enforcement activities ongoing at the border because mm -hmm. crime hasn't changed much. So there was a discussion on those issues. Uh, the response from the chief of staff, the governor's chief of staff, and the governor was that they were going to make sure they consulted with the law enforcement agencies in those particular areas to see how much they can do with assistance to try to keep them, to keep them at locations where they could be of actual assistance in terms of crime control. I mentioned to them that I felt, my feeling is that this wave of violence along the border, this cartel violence along the border, has a tendency to sleep over uh, across the border and that the high number of homicides across the border right now have a tendency to impact the homicide rate on this side because crime knows of no borders. Mm -hmm. And those type of things are what we needed to keep an eye on. And so therefore the assistance that the task force, both the border task force and the National Guard may be better um, looked at as a, as a, for their potential to, to help the law enforcement community in the border areas to sort of keep track of that and help and assist as much as they can. That was one of the main topics in there. There were affordable housing issues. There were a lot of other topics that were too long to discuss, but the border was the focus at that meeting. And I want to thank the governor and staff for allowing us to spend a couple of hours, you know, going over some of these issues as opposed to just five minutes and 10 minutes and moving on. Uh, which is sometimes normally what a governor's visit is, right? She comes over, she spends an hour, she goes, looks at something and goes back. This was a sit down meeting that allowed us to expand on some of these border issues that, uh, including the Arizona Border Commission and some of the discussions that were had along the lines of how can we make sure that that is, for the counties, a more effective tool than it has been in the past. 
Um, uh, also on the federal level, I did have a chance to speak to Mr. Siskomani, Juan Siskomani, and Stanton, which was in a plane actually where he couldn't move too far away. Uh, but, uh, you know, their responses, uh, you know, <laughs> some of them are already well informed, and I think Siskomani is well informed about issues, uh, Congressman Siskomani is well informed about issues on the border. So it wasn't very difficult to just simply touch on these issues and, and move on. I think. I think uh, in, in that, from that perspective, from the perspective of the border areas, I think we do have the right congressman in line there to discuss some of these issues with his other counterpart and bring some balance to the, the way they perceive the border. Because I think that that is a, 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 one of our main problems is the perception that there is that the only things that happen at the border are the crossings of refugees and asylum seekers when it's a very complex environment that has a lot of farming, that has a lot of law enforcement issues, that has a lot of more things to talk about other than just simply the border crossing, right? The H-2A. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that will conclude my presentation to the board. Mr. Chairman, if there's any questions. Thank you, Alex. And the only thing I'd like to comment is when you give this presentation, if you can make copies so we can follow you with a copy. I mean, you do have great presentations, but they're not normally, you put them up, but they're not normally available to us in, in a form that we can see, okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. Any questions? We probably should say thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, the next item in the, in the uh, calendar, the agenda is event calendar and current events. Board members and county minister will report an events attended to be, or to be attended on behalf of the county, may present a brief summary of current events and may update the schedule for future board of supervisory meetings appropriate, no legal action will be taken. So, Supervisor Pancras, do you want to start that off? Yes. Normally do. Um, I attended the Associated General Contractors of America's board meeting that was held here in Yuma. And um, I talked to them about how important it is for Prop 400 to pass. Do you know anything about that, Alejandro? Whether it, it's the half cent sales tax that's in Maricopa County for transportation that if it doesn't pass, um, it's huh? It just stalled. It's, it's stalled. Yeah. Okay, because um, her funds, because of the Casa Grande Accords, most of the her funds that normally went to Maricopa County now go out to the rural areas. But if their Prop 400 and their half cent sales tax doesn't get passed to the legislature and then get passed again by their um, their voters. We may have to share that again. Yeah. We'll yes, also. we'd have to share that her fund with the Maricopa County, and that's not a good thing. Okay, so um, I am. Um, you yeah, keep a close eye on that. Yes, I I talked to them about telling um, telling their their legislators that it's not an increase in taxes because those people are already paying it, and um, and that they would really be helping the rurals. You know, sometimes they feel, those big Maricopa County people feel like they're, the fact that they're helping rural people are, is, anyway. So anyway, but, um, so I talked to them about that. Um, I attended the CSA Legislative Policy Committee. Um, I drove to Phoenix uh, last week with YMPO, um, Crystal, Figueroa and um, Gary Knight and testified at the Senate Transportation Committee um, on House Bill 2543, which is Tim, another Tim Dunn bill that has to do with rural transportation. It's a list of bills um, all in rural, rural Arizona that didn't make the five-year plan and um, its infrastructure. and. Uh, highway 95 widening and the Highway 95 resurfacing between San Luis and Summerton is on that bill, is in that bill. And we got it through transportation. It's in appropriations this week. And so um, they will go back up again. I'm Unfortunately, I can't make it, but I have been emailing um, those who I know on the, on the appropriations committee asking them for their support. And um, so hopefully it'll get through uh, appropriations and then it'll go to the floor. Anyway, um, 
I had my meeting with Ian. I had a meeting with Judge Haas about an alternative um, um, pay increase. And I attended some of my meetings with Arizona at work. Thank you, Supervisor Simmons. Uh, attended a Welton a Library Volunteer Appreciation Luncheon. Um, well, the one tomorrow is the main library. This was one just for Welton. Good, I haven't missed um, Reference to what Lynn was saying about the highways, when Governor Hobbs was here, I was talking to her chief of staff about uh, all their millions of dollars of fancy artwork on their bridges and overpasses and walls, and why shouldn't that money be spent in rural Arizona instead of on all their artwork? And didn't have a lot to say on that one, but <laughs> kind of waiting to see. Uh, had a community meeting yeah, out in the foothills. Also had a meeting with Judge Hawes, uh, met with a new solar, comp solar company that's looking at anywhere from two to 9,000 acres out in the East County uh, solar project. Um, met with Ian, came out and we took a little tour of East County and then met with the uh, Welton Town Manager to talk to them on how we could help uh, the town with some items that uh, we might be able to help them with anyway and then uh, met with Rachel uh, Stallworth along with another individual referenced some issues out in the East County that he were trying to help him with or at least give him some guidance and that's about it all right well I, I think we talked about most of the stuff I was doing last week in the week prior to that and uh, the only thing I'd like to do is just remind everybody that this is fair week and there's a lot of stuff going on at the fair a lot of stuff with kids and you know, uh, what's it called? What's the program called? Farmers? FFA. FFA. There's a lot of stuff going on at the fair. Don't forget, it begins what? Tomorrow? Yep. Yes, it begins tomorrow at 11, um, and uh, rides open up at 1, and so does the commercial building, and uh, or 12 commercial building, and it uh, goes all week, and yeah. Good. It's a, it's a good and, thing. Yeah. It's, it's a tradition in Yuma County that goes back a long, long way. And um, in, in, it's still a pretty much uh, an event that people take part in a lot. And just to remind everyone, this is also uh, good. There's Good Friday. There's, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. That Easter keeps, Sunday. Easter Sunday is coming up. So don't forget to enjoy the time. Kids out of school. Kids yeah. out of school. So be careful out there. You know, the kids. Are not so well known for being following uh, the directions, uh, yeah. obeying every traffic, you know, every traffic rule. So please keep an eye on for those kids. And I, I want to, you know, thank everybody for being here. I know some of you didn't much, get much mm -hmm. chance to say something, but you know, thank you very much for everything, for the updates, and, and have a great week. And please avoid Pacific Avenue today, this afternoon, because uh, they're bringing in livestock, and that oh, livestock always gets crazy in, right there yeah. at the gate. All right. And just, I think I let Ian know, but I will not be here for the next meeting. Okay. All right. Well, it's summer. Uh, so I guess have fun have this week and go to the fair. It'll be so fun. You have to at least have one cinnamon roll. All right. Come on. Okay, Cindy. guys. <laughs> this okay. is it. I, Did Ian have anything? Ian, do you have anything? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Why sip the board meeting, Southwest Arizona Town Hall meeting. Uh, Supervisor Simmons and I met with uh, Richard. Marsh in the town of Welton, as he mentioned, meeting with representatives from Yuma Region Bicycle Coalition. Uh, met with Kimberly Dahl along with Alejandro. The, she's the uh, executive director of the Yuma County Chamber. Had uh, monthly meetings with Arizona at Work staff. Uh, remote meeting with Craig Sullivan and other county managers to discuss CSA budget development for the upcoming fiscal year. Met with transitional team representatives of the Arizona County's insurance pool to discuss succession planning for a long time. Executive Director Bill Hardy uh, continued my visits with county departments, including health district, public fiduciary, finance, and library district. <laughs> Submitted my annual report to ICMA, summarizing my professional development activities of the past year to maintain my credential manager standing. And just a reminder about the long term planning roundtable we're having Monday and Tuesday of next week, April 10th and 11th, at the main library from 8 30 to noon to discuss long-term planning initiatives and kick off the strategic plan update. And that's my report. Thank you, Mr. Right, well, I want to thank the County Sheriff's Department, again, Leon Wilma, <laughs> just in case yeah. anybody forget for sending us such a, yeah. 
that was a thank you very much really appreciate it so it is indeed very special thank you very much and i appreciate the attorney both being here at the same time bill